Welcome to the webinar, What New Hampshire Providers Need to Know About Gambling and Gambling Disorder. This webinar is produced in conjunction with the New Hampshire Council for Responsible Gambling. And I'm joined today by Drs. Debbie LaPlante and Heather Gray. My name is Ed Talbot. I'm a commissioner with the Council on Responsible Gambling. And I'm also Ed T., recovering compulsive gambler with 44 years of abstinence since gambling. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my background before I go into the gambling addiction and my recovery. I'm the oldest of three boys. My dad was a pharmacist, my mother was a nurse. My formative years were all spent around family, school, church, and sports. Both parents worked shifts so that were conducive to allowing them to be around for the boys. Dad was usually home by 10 o'clock in the evening, so mom could go to work on the 11 to 7 shift. Our family was very involved in our local Catholic church, where I was an altar server for many years. We were fortunate to have a wonderful group of priests assigned to our parish. On several occasions, my younger brother and I, playing ball in the neighborhood park, were picked up by the parish priest, brought home to check with mom to make sure it was okay, and take it to Fenway Park for an afternoon Red Sox game. After first grade, I transferred to parochial elementary school and subsequently a Catholic high school. I was always involved in playing sports, primarily baseball, basketball, football, and even street hockey. There was always some kind of game going on in the neighborhood. Our backyard was the official wiffle ball field. Organized sports were primarily basketball and baseball, and I continued post high school. A memory that sticks with me till today is really having a parent attend one of my games. My mother never did, and dad really. During my junior year in high school, the driver of our carpool asked us to, three of us to chip in 50 cents because he was going to play a daily double at the local dog track. I contributed my 50 cents. The next day, he got into the car and informed us that we had won $21. Split four, split four ways wasn't a lot of money, but the seed was planted, easy money. From my early years, I had always planned on becoming a priest. I entered St. Thomas Seminary in Bloomfield, Connecticut for my first year and was assigned to St. Jerome's College now Resurrection College in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. I played basketball and baseball at both those schools. And by the end of the second year, realized that the priesthood was not for me. I did some substitute teaching prior to enlisting in the United States Army National Guard and serving my required six months duty. I returned to school at Bridgewater State University and was introduced to Greyhound Racing. A few of my friends from my youth would go occasionally and invited me to tag along. I really enjoyed the excitement and the occasional win and we kept going back. There was one particular dog we were very fond of and enjoyed betting on. He was entered in the American Greyhound Derby and we were committed to a large wager on him to win. I backed off a little on my bet and I bet $50 to win and $50 to play, so I'll finish second. I managed to avoid a total loss when he rallied and lost in a photo finish, but I recovered enough money to offset my loss. Rather than the money, I can still recall the excitement as they were, dogs were being loaded into the box. I, I was scared, risking as much money as I had, but also enjoyed that excitement. And I knew now I was hooked on dog racing. The following year where I returned to school, took a part-time job as an orderly at a local hospital, met a beautiful nurse, fell in love and got married. One year into our marriage, our only child, a daughter Lisa was born. Now married with a child and teaching in a parochial school for a lot of prayers, but not much money, I had to supplement my income. As fate would have it, there was a strike going on by workers at the dog track and they were looking for people to cross the picket line and work. I signed up and began 11 year plunge into gambling addiction. 
the two tracks in our area were allotted 90 days or nights of racing each year. And they ran from April the 1st to November 30th. I put everything I had into my job and progressed rapidly from a $2 seller to the $50 window and eventually an administrative position as assistant racing secretary and steward. Gambling, like other addictions, is progressive. And each year saw me progressing negatively in my finances, my home life, and my character. The bottom line was always a loss, no matter how I spun it. Absences from home, missing money, and accompanying lives, secret loans, each year brought promises to be better, work less, bet less, lie less, but the story never changed. Marriage counseling during one season saw me spin the counselor around for making her wrong for criticizing my ability to go out and earn extra money for the family, but the money was never coming home. The final years I realized were the chasing phase of my addiction. There's no way I could earn the money to pay off the debts. I chased the big hit, the big lie. A year before I stopped gambling, my mother was about to lose her eight year battle with cancer. She spoke to her three sons individually and her words to me were not that, I love you, Ed, you've been a good son. Although I know she felt that. She said, if you don't stop your gambling, you will lose everything. She died the next morning and I proved over the next year, I proved her absolutely right. I gambled more than I ever had. Got to the point where I was borrowing money, lying, trying to cover for absences from the home, lying that bills were being paid and my wife had had enough and asked me, wanted me out of the house. I welcomed the change. I quit my full-time sales job and decided I was gonna be a professional gambler. The track that I didn't work at was open in the afternoons for 30 days of matinee racing and I could do absolutely nothing wrong. My wins piled up, I was pottying, but doing absolutely nothing with my responsibility to home. They switched tonight after 30 days and it's, my gambling luck completely changed. The losses just kept piling up and my answer was to gamble more. On the final night of racing, November 30th, 1977 at Taunton Dog Track, I bet what little money I had left on a dog by the name of Perfect Treasure. The starting box opened, the dogs came out and Perfect Treasure fell and my dream world had come crashing down. Five days later, I contemplated suicide with a dive off a bridge over the Taunton River. The only reason I believe I didn't follow through with that was my daughter Lisa deserved better than having a dad cop out in that way. I felt as I had failed as a father, a son, a husband, a student, an athlete, and now as a gambler. The next day I spoke with a priest I had recently met. He recommended Gamblers Anonymous and a psychologist. The psychologist recommended Gamblers Anonymous in addition to counseling. Although I had done this, had heard this before, I felt it didn't apply to me. My view was a, of a gambler was one who bets on everything. I was a Greyhound specialist. I didn't bet big money, but I didn't have big money. I only bet part time. The dog track was open part of the year. I didn't go to casinos. I didn't bet on the lottery. All these objections I had voiced over the years faded and allowed me to attend my first Gamblers Anonymous meeting. Ironically, it was in the basement of a parochial school and on my mother's birthday. Walking into the hall, I noticed a half dozen men standing around talking and even laughing. I recognized half of them from playing sports with them and seeing them at the track. I immediately took an inventory of them and said they need to be here after seeing some of the bets that they had made. About 20 men attended the meeting with a wide range of experience and serenity in the program. I was the only newcomer that evening and learned it's customary to read step one when an individual attends his first meeting. I said his first meeting because it was years before I saw a woman in the rooms of Gamblers Anonymous. But step one says, I am powerless over gambling and my life was unmanageable. I agreed with the second part. My life surely was unmanageable, but powerless over gambling, not me. 
I listened. I identified with others. I heard things I liked, some I didn't. One comment from that meeting that has struck with me over the years, and I often quote to newcomers, is if you, if you don't gamble and follow the suggestions in this program, your life will get better. My life is a testament to that. It didn't promise that there would be, I would be rich or avoid difficulties in my life or gain notoriety. I have encountered unemployment, underemployment, sickness, divorce, and some major disappointments, but none have led me back to gamble. I left the meeting with an invitation from three of the guys I knew to meet for coffee in the morning. I drove back to my dad's house where I was living, feeling better than I had and hopeful. I could turn things around. I called my wife immediately and told her I had gone to GA and enjoyed it and I was ready to come home. And her response was, tell it to the next one and hung up. I was devastated. I was finally doing what she had wanted. But she wasn't satisfied. As the years of destroying her trust in me, I'm upset because she, didn't, she isn't ready to welcome me home just because I attended one meeting. I did go for coffee with the next morning and to another meeting the next night. The morning coffee became a routine and we attended meetings three or four nights a week for a couple of months. The morning coffee sessions usually touched on our gambling. One of our crew began questioning me about what I was going to do as brother's work. I wasn't employed. I wasn't looking for a job. I was sponging off my dad said, you have to do something, at least go down and sign up for unemployment. I did look, put my name in, in for several jobs. And two weeks later, I received my first employment check and bragged at coffee about the check finally came in. And this one guy said, now send half of it home to your wife. And I said, why? She kicked me out of the house. You have a responsibility still to support your family. So I did as he suggested. A little while later, a few days later, he asked me what I was going to do about my job at the track. And I said, what do you mean? He says, you're just playing a game. If you get back in the house, you'll quit your job at the track. But if you don't, you still, still plan on working there. And that would look, be like being on a diet and working in a candy store for you. I took his advice, went to the track, said I was resigning my position and turned in the key to an office I was working at, at the track. I still continued to tell meetings several times a week. At one of those meetings, I met Tom C., Tom Cummings. Tom always said that I was at his first meeting. If I was at his first meeting, it must have been my third meeting because it was right around the same time. Tom went on to stopped the Massachusetts Council on Problem Gambling. And he had asked me at the time if I would be interested in working with him and trying to get the organization go. I had just taken a job at the sheriff's office and was unable to do it, but I didn't know I had been listed as one of the incorporators for the Mass Council way back when. And later on when I served as on the Mass Council as a treasurer, Tom Longo, the treasurer said, you've been in training for this position for years. Tom always had you listed as the treasurer of the corporation. On February 6th of 1978, I was living with my dad in Fall River and my wife and daughter lived in a small town 20 miles away. My wife was director of, her nursing, of nursing at a facility in Fall River while my daughter was in elementary school. A student in a, in a hometown. Around noon, I received a call from my wife asking if I could pick Lisa up because she wasn't sure when she could get out of work. A lot of people were calling in sick because the storm was predicted to be a blizzard and dump a lot of snow. I headed out in the snow and strengthening wind and the trip, which normally took 25 minutes, took two and a half hours. We headed back to Fall River as conditions worsened. Three and a half hours later, my old unmaintained Ford Maverick stall and succumb to the storm a block from my dad's house. My wife arrived later that evening and our family was reunited for the next week. The time spent together allowed for plans that would eventually lead me home two months later. It would be appropriate if I added that we lived happily ever after. 
We stayed together for 11 years and all grew, to get, and grew together as well as individually. But eventually it didn't work out. Our, we still have a great friendship to this day. I always get recognition on my anniversary for my absence of gambling. So that's a plus. And of course, with the grandchildren now, we share a lot of special memories and moments. Our GA crew decided to form a team in an over 30 basketball league. I was eager to participate in sports that I always enjoyed. The only problem was I was sadly out of shape, carrying 75 extra pounds and smoking two to three packs of cigarettes a day. I needed to address this for many reasons, but the basketball play prompted it. I began by running in place in the cellar and eventually got to the local high school track. I was seeing the results of my efforts on the scale, but I was still smoking and knew if I wanted to continue running, smoking would have to go. I quit mo smoking the same way I quit gambling, one day at a time. I went on to run for 35 years, 56,352 miles, completed 20 marathons, including six Bostons, as well as hundreds of road races, and I'm a firm believer, and I am a firm believer in the benefit of exercise can play in the recovery from addiction. A compulsive gambler loses three things due to his addiction, money, values, and time. The money can never be replaced. In my case, that amounted to approximately $40,000, and it took eight years for me to pay back my debt. I certainly wasn't brought up to be a liar, a cheater, or a thief, and yet I did all three as part of my addiction. I like to think, to think today I've restored the values that I learned growing up. By far the biggest regret from my gambling years is the time I took away from my daughter, Lisa. Daddy was always too busy to watch a gymnastics routine or wouldn't take a night off from the track for her birthday. As she reminded me years later, I didn't show for a school field trip I was supposed to chaperone because I was busy with my track job. Years later, the damage created by these absences surfaced and our relationship was strained. Little or no communication with her in grad school out in California and me back in Massachusetts working at the sheriff's office and growing in my recovery. One day I got a call from Lisa and asked if I would give her advice on beginning a running program. Like her dad, she had a weight problem and was choosing to address it with running. We spoke regularly and she took, the, took to the sport as I did. She lost weight, increased her mileage, and had, ha had her heart set on running her first marathon in Portland, Oregon. Unfortunately, she suffered a stress fracture and had to postpone her marathon debut. The following year, the Boston Marathon was celebrating its 100th running and she asked if I could get her an entry. I had been worse working for Boston as a volunteer for several years and was able to get the entry. She came back from California, ran Boston, and I was there to greet her at the finish. Several years later, I accompanied her to a marathon in Cincinnati, Ohio. Our plan was while she was running the marathon, I would run a shorter race and meet her out on the course during the race. I finished my race, went to mile 21 and waited for Lisa and became concerned when she was later than, I had planned, than she had planned. Eventually, she got to mile 21 looking weary but sounding positive. I met her at the finish line where she looked better than she did at mile 21. That night at dinner, she was replaying the race and said her stomach was giving her trouble, her legs were heavy, but she kept thinking, thinking run to daddy, run to daddy, knowing you'd be there. For me, that was redemption. And today, our relationship has never been stronger. I'm frequently asked what I attribute my recovery to, and I always respond with four-pronged approach that works for me. Gamblers Anonymous, then and now, is still vitally important to me. The professional help I received when I first stopped gambling was essential because it wasn't just the gambling. It was a lot of the things that I did in order to gamble, and especially to escape responsibility. Third, a healthy lifestyle. Not only exercise, but eating healthy and being health conscious. And four, but certainly not last, a spiritual relationship with a higher power. Not the God-fearing lightning bolt coming down from the sky, but me getting on my knees, asking for help each day 
to stay free of gambling and thoughts about gambling, trusting that that help will be there during the day and then thanking at night. I know people who have succeeded using one, two, or three of these, but I don't know anyone who has used it, who has achieved it using willpower. And I tried several times and that never worked. Now I'd like to take you, tell you a little bit about the New Hampshire Council on Problem Gambling. The New Hampshire Council on Problem Gambling was actually incorporated in 1996. It was run in conjunction with the Vermont Council on Problem Gambling by the same person. In 2009, the National Council said each state had to be independent. So a group of us tried to get New Hampshire Council restored. However, they had lost their 501c3 status with the internal revenue. It took several months to get it restored. I believe it was a year and a half total before we received it. And we put together a group of four or five individuals to work on getting the council up and running. In 2015, New Hampshire Council began action in the state by providing a helpline doing outreach at recovery centers, making presentation in recovery coach academies, and responding to public information requests, whether it be from the legislature, public hearing when people were seeking to expand gambling. And we serve today in that capacity. The mission of the council is we are a private nonprofit agency created to address the social, financial, emotional, and cost of problem gambling. The council provides for information, education, advocacy, prevention services, as well as referrals to treatment for problem gambling to those affected, their loved ones, and the community in general. The council has an, maintains an office at 100 North Main Street on the fourth floor in the Eagle Square in Concord, New Hampshire. Our phone number for the helpline is 603 724-1605. The business number is 603-225-9540 with extension 122. Thank you for sharing your story, Commissioner Talbot. And it illustrates several of the concepts that I'll be talking about in my own presentation, which I've entitled Gambling Disorder 101. Um, some disclosures before I begin. I am currently a commissioner for the New Hampshire Council for Responsible Gambling. I'm a former board member of the New Hampshire Council on Problem Gambling. I'm a faculty member of the Division on Addiction at Cambridge Health Alliance. And the Division on Addiction currently has funding from the entities that you see on your screen now. The agenda for my portion of this webinar is as follows. I'll be discussing how a behavior can be an addiction. And then I'll put that all into the context of the syndrome model of addiction. I'll review the diagnostic criteria and epidemiology of gamma disorder. Then I'll discuss some common comorbidities of gamma disorder and the relationship between gambling and self-harm. And I'll wrap up by discussing some gambling opportunities that are currently available in New Hampshire. So I'm going to start on a topic that you might not have expected, given that our focus is on gambling disorder, and that topic is OxyContin. As some of you might know, the drugs manufacturer, Purdue Pharma, aggressively and deceptively marketed the drug, convincing doctors and patients alike that their risk of addiction was low. For example, in this ad, the presenter said, some patients may be afraid of taking opioids because they're perceived as too strong or addictive but that is far from actual fact. Less than 1% of patients taking opioids actually become addicted. Now, I think that many people watching this webinar might be surprised that Purdue made this claim. After all, we know now that it's really more like 10 to 20% of chronic OxyContin users who developed an opioid use disorder or showed signs of abuse. Their experience, which some viewers might already be familiar with, either from personal or professional experience, illustrates the development of addiction more generally. 
So the drug triggers a biochemical process that rewards people with feelings of pleasure. Activation of the reward circuitry can motivate repeated use of the drug. And over time, the person develops tolerance. They need more and more of the experience to get the same reward. But that ex repeated exposure to escalating doses changes the brain so that it functions more or less normally when the drug is present and abnormally when it's not. And then reward deficiency sets in and things that would normally activate the reward circuitry, like eating something delicious or seeing a picture of a smiling baby, they don't have the same effect anymore. And all of that sets a stage for withdrawal symptoms. Use of the drug to prevent withdrawal rather than for pleasure and ultimately dependence. The person continues to use the drug despite mounting consequences simply to avoid withdrawal and the rest of life or what used to make the person who they really are starts to fade into the background. And that way the addictive properties of a drug like Oxycontin or as you'll see of a behavior like gambling fit into Norman Zinberg's drug set and setting model of addiction. We need to keep in mind that this is a complex interaction and the set and setting are important components. The set is the mental state that a person brings to the experience, like thoughts, moods, and expectations. We've all heard stories about people who began taking opioids for physical pain, but found that they temporarily relieved psychological pain too, and that contributed to the development of their addiction. The setting is the physical and social environment where the drug use or the behavior takes place. So the main point I want to make is that we don't need to ingest a substance like an opioid to experience the addiction and its neurological hallmarks, tolerance and withdrawal. Some behaviors, especially in combination with certain sets and settings can set the stage for an addiction as devastating as any other. Neuroscientists have speculated that the anticipation of gambling produces a dramatic increase in the release of dopamine into the synapse. That anticipatory dopamine response may constitute a common underpinning of gambling disorder and substance use disorder. And neuroimaging evidence suggests that there is the reward deficiency syndrome among people experiencing gambling disorder. In other words, they tend not to find things motivating or rewarding that used to be so once gambling takes hold. And at least one study indicates that reward deficiency syndrome resolves after treatment with cognitive behavioral therapy, which Dr. LaPlante will describe in more detail. So I wanna put all of this into the context of the syndrome model of addiction which was advanced by Dr. Howard Schaefer, Dr. LaPlante, and other colleagues at the Division on Addiction. The syndrome model provides an overarching theoretical framework for addiction. It conceptualizes various expressions of addiction as opportunistic disorders that have a common underlying etiological factors. As I describe the syndrome model, keep in mind the definition of a syndrome, which is a group of symptoms which consistently occur together or a condition characterized by a set of associated symptoms. So let's talk about the syndrome model in more detail. So on the left-hand side of the panel, you'll see distant, distal antecedents. These might include neurobiological elements such as genetic risk, or a neurobiological system risk. So things that a person is born with that makes them more susceptible to the experiences that I described earlier. And this also includes psychosocial elements, such as pre-existing mental health conditions, poverty, risky peer groups, and so on. And these two combine to produce an underlying vulnerability to addiction syndrome. Another essential antecedent of the addiction syndrome is exposure to an object or an activity. Over their lifetimes, people have access to and experience with many different potential objects of addiction, whether they be alcohol, cigarettes, gambling, or something else. 
Interacting with such objects can expose at-risk individuals to neurobiological consequences that are common to all objects of addiction, including activation of the brain's reward circuitry. So you need to have exposure and interactions. If the potential object of addiction provides immediate neurobiological consequences that result in a desirable subjective shift, in other words, if it reliably makes them feel good or makes them feel less bad, then the stage is set for addiction. And a person is considered to be in a pre-morbid addiction phase. And during this phase, a person is repeatedly interacting with that object of addiction, um, whether it be a substance or a behavior like gambling, and they're experiencing that desirable subjective shift. Now that subjective shift is different for different people. The important thing is that it's desirable to the person and reliable, they can expect it whenever they use the substance or engage in the behavior. And at this stage, proximal antecedents, so uh, life experiences, can tip a person towards a more or less healthy relationship with that object of addiction. So you can imagine life experiences like getting divorced, losing a job, living through a pandemic, which tip a person towards a less healthy relationship with the object of addiction, or maybe even into full-blown addiction. Or you can imagine proximal antecedents or life events that happen, um, which shift a person towards a more healthy relationship with the object of addiction. So for instance, if someone is um, visiting their primary care doctor and the subject of gambling comes up, and if the doctor is aware of gambling and aware of brief screens for gambling and provides one, then the person might begin to realize that they should start to think about changing their gambling. And they might have that realization before they develop a full-blown uh, addiction. So that's the pre-morbid addiction phase. And finally, on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see unique and common consequences. So for instance, imagine three expressions of addiction to drinking, to gambling, and to smoking. And the unique consequences are fairly obvious to all of us. So uh, a person with an alcohol use disorder is more likely to experience liver cirrhosis than a person with a gamma disorder. A person with gamma disorder is more likely to experience debt that can feel insurmountable uh, compared to someone who can't stop smoking and someone who's Smoking is more likely to experience lung cancer. So there's room in the syndrome model for these unique consequences, but the syndrome model also proposes, and evidence supports this, that there are several common biological, social, and psychological consequences, and also that the pathways to recovery can be common across different expressions of addiction. Let's review the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for gambling disorder. So when there's persistent and recurrent problematic gambling behavior leading to clinically significant impairment or, or distress, it's the precursor to a diagnosis of gambling disorder. And the specific criteria are as follows. The person is being preoccupied with gambling. They're unable to cut back or control their gambling. They feel irritable or restless when they do attempt to cut back. They over time risk more money to reach the desired level of excitement, that's tolerance. They gamble to escape problems or depressed mood. As Commissioner Talbot illustrated in his own story, they chase losses, tend to lie to, about their gambling to friends and family members and others risks or even lose their relationships or jobs because of their gambling, and finally rely on other people for financial needs because of the toll of gambling. And clinicians are encouraged to specify whether the gambling disorder is episodic or persistent, or whether uh, a client is in an early or sustained remission. It's also important to clarify whether these um, diagnostic criteria are better explained by manic episode. And the threshold 
for a diagnosis of gambling disorder is four or more symptoms in a 12 month period. Moving on now, I'd like to briefly review the epidemiology of gambling disorder. So you can think about gambling disorder like many other conditions in, in this sort of way uh, where the relative size in the population is inverse, inverse to the severity of the condition. So the fewest people in the population have the most severe expression of the dis disorder. About 85% of Americans um, report that they gamble and about 3% um, report uh, problem gambling. And here we're defining problem gambling as gambling disorder as well as um, subclinical gambling disorder. So people who um, would meet some of the criteria that I reviewed earlier, but not enough to um, meet the threshold for gambling disorder. And then about 1% um, meet the diagnostic threshold for gambling disorder. And we can further um, delineate that group into those with um, mild case of gambling disorder or four to five criteria, moderate or six to seven criteria, or a severe case of gambling disorder. And that would be people who meet eight or nine of the diagnostic criteria. One thing to be really cautious about is that gambling disorder often co-occurs with other mental health conditions. In one nationally representative survey, 96% of people with gambling disorder met the criteria for another, at least one other psychiatric disorder, most commonly substance use disorders, anxiety disorders, and mood disorders. And in most cases, about 75% of cases, the other condition came first. So this implies that having a psychiatric disorder is a risk factor for developing gambling disorder more commonly than the other way around. And psychiatric comorbidity can complicate treatment for and recovery for clients struggling with their gambling. And so it's essential that healthcare providers explore the nature of the relationship between gambling disorder and the co-occurring conditions and the possibility that if left untreated, they will reinforce each other. Let's review briefly um, the research on gambling and self-harm. So we can imagine um, at least two different pathways between these experiences. And Commissioner Talbot um, described his own experience with um, feelings of suicidality that um, stemmed from his uh, gambling problems and feeling of um, hopelessness, feeling like he will never be able to overcome his debt. Um, some people report feeling like a burden to other people and that they, uh, their loved ones would be better off if they weren't around anymore. And so that's one potential pathway between problem gambling and suicidality. Sometimes people also report that once they've made a decision to die by suicide, then they feel like they might as well gamble whatever they have left. And so you could imagine how this would become a vicious cycle between problem gambling and suicidality. My colleagues and I at the Division on Addiction conducted a scoping review to see what the existing scientific literature had to say about the association between problem gambling and suicidality. We found that there are over 30 studies that found an association between gambling or problem gambling and self-harm, even after the authors accounted for other factors that might explain that relationship. And so the bottom line for clinicians is that you should be aware of the risk of suicide among people with problem gambling and screen for suicide risk among these clients. Finally, now I'll briefly review some gambling opportunities in New Hampshire and the history here. So back in 1933, the state legalized um, horse race betting as a way to earn some revenue during the Great Depression. And currently, no facilities in the state offer live horse or greyhound racing, but a facility in Seabrook offers simulcast um, horse and greyhound racing. Bingo games and the sale of Lucky 7 or pull tab tickets were legalized in 1949. 
New Hampshire, as many of you might know, became the first state to launch the lottery back in 1964. The state legalized poker casino in 1977. Um, the games must be offered by registered charity organizations. And according to the state's website, there are now 15 charity casinos throughout the state. And more recently, there's been a rapid expansion of gaming in the form of daily fantasy sports, keno, and sports betting. So the main point here is that New Hampshire is a heavily involved gambling state. And of course, residents can gamble in many, many other ways, such as by traveling to neighboring states, which offer different legal gambling opportunities or gambling illegally. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Debbie LaPlante. Thank you, Dr. Gray, and thank you, Commissioner Talbot. In this section of the webinar, I'm going to speak about practical information for addressing gambling in your practice. I'll start by sharing my disclosures. I'm a commissioner for the New Hampshire Council on Responsible Gambling and a former member of the New Hampshire Council on Problem Gambling Board of Directors. The following sources provide funding for my work at the Division on Addiction, and I specifically want to note and disclose that I'll be speaking about DraftKings later in this talk, and they are one of our research and responsible gambling funders. <clears throat> Commissioner Talbot and Dr. Gray provided a lot of insight about how people can develop problems with gambling. My goal today is to share a bit about what I know about how people can resolve those problems. I'll start by suggesting that there's no one way to achieve recovery. Many people think that a person is stuck with the gambling problem for the rest of their lives. However, a lot of people have gambling problems for less than a year. Some people develop a gambling problem, get better, and then develop another one later. <clears throat> a lot of people's problems subside on their own without any help. This tends to occur in people with less severe problems. Those who develop them through through a certain pathway by learning it over time. Those with more serious gambling issues often require treatment. Longer term studies of gambling show that the course of gambling problems is a lot more variable than people expect. So for example, studies show that people who experience the most severe gambling problems also see improvement in their symptoms. They aren't as likely to do, the, do this than people, they aren't less likely to do this than people who have less severe problems. These findings provide an opportunity for optimism. They also might help us improve the resources that we offer for gambling problems. So what are the ways that people might recover? They won't be that different from other expressions of addiction. A lot of people get better on their own. This might occur because people age out of behavior that they engaged in when they were younger, or it might just even occur because of time through natural recovery. Other people might require engaging with mutual support groups or professionals in treatment plans that you're likely to be familiar with, such as CBT, motivational interviewing, relapse prevention activities, and more. To provide a deeper look at some of the treatment strategies that you might consider, I'll turn now to a consideration of evidence-based practices for treating gambling. <clears throat> But before that, a little bit more about problem gambling itself. You might be surprised to hear that not one person in a recent US nationally representative study who reported gambling related problems also reported seeking treatment for their gambling. However, this finding didn't mean that these people did not seek treatment at all. On the contrary, they frequently sought treatment just for something else. 49% of respondents with lifetime pathological gambling receive treatment for emotional problems or substance use problems in their life. This suggests that there's a meaningful number of people who might be experiencing undiagnosed or unrecognized gambling related problems within our treatment systems. Alternatively, it might reflect an important aspect of patient preferences, such as negative experiences with past treatment or potentially ongoing stigma associated with gambling treatment. Likewise, poor treatment uptake could relate to limitations in the available, available workforce, or alternatively, some unknown barriers to actually re reaching expertise that's available. Finally, it's possible that some people already are on the path to recovery, independent of any related treatment experience. 
Unfortunately, people often don't seek treatment for gambling until it's to the point of crisis, including severe financial, legal, and relationship problems. So what do we know about what works for gambling? What's the best available evidence? I'll start you down this path by giving you an insider's look at our own most recent attempt to identify and summarize the best available evidence for treating gambling. We had four main goals for this work. First, we wanted to examine the full spectrum of evidence that was available for different treat treatment approaches. We didn't want to restrict ourselves to only randomized clinical trials, for example. We also looked at other study designs. Second, we wanted to include a variety of treatment approaches and not restrict to a specific type or approach. Third, we wanted to apply an objective categorization of treatment approaches. We hope <clears throat> with the hope that sorting different types of treatment plans could more closely represent treatment types in practice. Fourth, we accounted for delivery formats or the way that a particular treatment approach was delivered, for example, in person or remotely. <clears throat> Ultimately, our goal was to do a systematic review that would allow us to highlight the best available evidence for delivering specific treatment using evidence-supported approaches. We did specifically look at whether studies might be called robust randomized clinical trials. We defined this as involving a randomized trial, including a true control group, such as a placebo or weightless control, and statistically testing the intervention effect between treatment and the control group. We used a broad search strategy, including a lot of different databases, journal searches, and the a lot of different possible search terms. And this resulted in 8,568 published papers. From there, we needed to narrow down. We combed through studies to see which ones were published in English, which ones were peer reviewed, and used other criteria to determine their eligibility. In combing through the studies, we determined that 7,580 were irrelevant just by title alone. Another 845 were excluded for other reasons. <clears throat> In the end, we settled on 143 clinical research papers as our eligible group of studies for detailed review. And we did a close look at all of those. In our detailed review of the 143 studies, we considered whether the studies might be called robust randomized clinical trials. In the end, we identified a total of 46 papers that met our definition and survived the screening process. We coded those 46 on five primary factors, delivery format, such as whether the study involved a brief treatment or in-person modality, therapy exclusivity, segregating studies that had a singular treatment comprising 80% of therapeutic contact or some other percentage that would indicate a hybrid approach, therapy type, <clears throat> whether there was a favorable outcome and whether there had been studies completed by distinct research teams. <clears throat> From this coding, we identified three primary levels of empirical evidence. The first we call best available. For us, best available refers to treatment types that have <clears throat> available at least two robust randomized clinical trials from different sources that show clinically meaningful improvements related to gambling. <clears throat> Developing evidence in contrast refers to those treatment types that only have a single clinical trial available that reports meaningful clinical improvement or trials that are supportive, but from the same research team. Finally, limited evidence refers to those treatments that have been the subject of study, but with the most preliminary approaches, including case studies, pre-post design, and the like. I focus mainly on the best available evidence in this presentation. We identified three treatment types that we can label as having best available empirical evidence for treating gambling. You've probably heard of them. They're cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational enhancement, and integrated CBT and MI. For cognitive behavioral therapy, we note the availability of 11 robust randomized clinical trials that report favorable treatment outcomes. For motivational enhancement, we note 10 such, 10 such robust randomized clinical trials. And for integrated CBT and MI, we note four published favorable, robust, randomized clinical trials. 
We also identified five delivery formats that we can label as having the best available empirical evidence for treating gambling. These include brief interventions, group therapy, self-help approaches, individual therapy, and therapy delivered remotely. Each of these has between seven and 13 favorable robust randomized clinical trials, at least two of which are from separate research teams. But this isn't all that you need to know. Importantly, every treatment approach that we identified as having the best available evidence has not been tested for every delivery format that we identified as having the best available evidence. So in guiding how to approach treatment, it's essential to consider whether the best available evidence for each meets in the middle and how it does. Here's what we know. For CBT, brief intervention does not yet have an appropriate robust randomized clinical trial, though it does have enough for self-help and remote delivery to make these formats promising for CBT. The best available evidence that's available for CBT is delivered by group therapy or individual therapy. Therefore, we determined that the best available evidence for traditional exists for traditional formats among predominantly CBT interventions whereas CBT delivered by both self-help or remote delivery formats has developing evidence and requires additional research. For motivational interviewing, group therapy formats have not been examined, but motivational interviewing studies have robust randomized clinical trials involving brief intervention, self-help, remote delivery, and individual therapy. And that's where the best available evidence sits. Finally, for integrated CBT and MI, we observed that individual therapy might be considered a developing delivery format and that the best available evidence is for integrated CBT and MI to be delivered by self-help and remote delivery. Assuming that such guidelines have some use, I'd suggest that they can help providers select the best tools for the clinical situation. However, Evidence-based practices are not mandates, and clinicians who use their own clinical insight and knowledge of the patients might select alternatives that are just as useful and effective. The availability of evidence-based practices does not mean that other strategies won't work. Rather, it just means that there isn't any empirical evidence for those strategies yet. Even if there is meaningful clinical evidence of successes for a particular technique in other areas, in adopting evidence-based guidelines, this needs to be kept at the forefront as, the well, as well as the need to account for both clinician and patient concerns. <clears throat> so evidence-based practices aren't a replacement for thoughtful clinical work. Rather, the goal of evidence-based practices is to infuse clinical work with the best scientific research, thereby guiding practice and training. In this last section of the webinar, I'd like to turn now to resources for helping people with their gambling that are available to you in New Hampshire. To start, you should be familiar with two primary organizations that focus on gambling. First, the New Hampshire Council on Responsible Gambling is the official state entity dedicated to reducing gambling risks through the Granite State through education, prevention, and treatment. We promote safe gambling in New Hampshire by helping local stakeholders mitigate risk, minimize harm, and uncover new insights about gambling and its impact on people, businesses, and communities. The New Hampshire Council on Responsible Gambling consists of five members appointed by the Governor and Executive Council. Each member is qualified in the field of addiction or mental health services with a focus on problem gambling and is a resident of New Hampshire. One of the entities that we support is the New Hampshire Council on Problem Gambling. As Commissioner Talbot indicated, the New Hampshire Council on Problem Gambling is a private nonprofit agency created to address the social, financial, and emotional costs of problem gambling. The council provides information, education, advocacy, and prevention services, as well as referrals to treatment for problem gambling to those affected, their loved ones, and the community. <clears throat> The New Hampshire Council on Problem Gambling operates a help helpline for New Hampshire that's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the number is 603-274-1605.
To help people better understand their risk for gambling disorders, you can consider using free screening tools. The Division on Addiction created a three item tool called the Brief Biosocial Gambling Screen or the BBGS. You can find it on the division's website. The three items are during the past 12 months, have you become restless, irritable or anxious when trying to stop or cut down on gambling? During the past 12 months, have you tried to keep your family or friends from knowing how much you gambled? And during the past 12 months, did you have such financial trouble as a result of your gambling that you had to get help with living expenses from family, friends, or welfare? Answering affirmatively to any one of these three items indicates risk for a gambling-related problem and the need for additional assessment and diagnosis. The BBGS is available in more than 20 languages on the division's website. <clears throat> New Hampshire does have some limited Gamblers Anonymous meeting availability, but there are many more meetings just over the border in Massachusetts and also in Maine and Vermont. And additionally, smart recovery meetings might be an appropriate uh, place to recommend people struggling with gambling um, to go. Another great resource to offer people who might be thinking about changing their gambling is the self-help workbook, Your First Step to Change. The second edition of this workbook is available in English, and the first edition is available in Spanish, Chinese, Cambodian, and Vietnamese. You can order hard copies of the English version from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Public Health Clearinghouse and electronic versions of everything are available on the division's basis website listed here. Your first step to change has three primary sections. The first provides readers with facts about gambling and gambling disorder. It answers questions like what is gambling and what is gambling disorder? It also provides definitions of things like streaks, luck, and odds. The second section provides readers with an opportunity to reflect on their gambling and other wellness experiences by providing brief screens for gambling and other conditions like anxiety and depression. The third section helps readers begin to think about changes that they might make to their gambling. It includes change decision tools and other similar exercises. The tone of the workbook suggests that the decision about whether to change or not is in the hands of readers. <clears throat> We're fortunate um, to have the opportunity to complete a two-site randomized clinical trial of your first step to change and observe that the workbook users were more likely to report abstaining from gambling than weightless controls. There are a number of excellent popular press books about changing gambling habits. The division recommends that interested folks look at Change Your Gambling, Change Your Life because it includes consideration of the many types of co-occurring conditions that a person who is struggling with gambling might have. So this book has a heavy comorbidity theme and provides many practical screens and change tools. Change tools. Another free resource that can facilitate self-education is the Brief Addiction Science Information Source or The Basis. This is a longstanding research blog that distills scientific papers about addiction for general public consumption. The segment of the basis dedicated to gambling called the wager, which stands for the Worldwide Addiction Gambling Education Report. <clears throat> the basis also hosts electronic versions of the Your First Step to Change workbook that I described a few moments ago. Some of New Hampshire's gambling operators also provide some very specific tools that you could recommend to people struggling with gambling. For example, on DraftKings New Hampshire website, they provide links to self-assessment tools and education resources. New Hampshire's New Hampshire Council on Problem Gambling website and helpline and safer gambling tools like deposit, wagering, and time limits, which allows people to restrict the amount of money they can deposit or wager or the amount of time they can spend on the website. DraftKings also offers online voluntary self-exclusion, which is a way for people to lock themselves out of DraftKings for the long term. I've covered a lot of tools, resources, and materials directly relevant to gambling disorder and gambling harm that are available to you. But I also want to mention just a couple of important issues that are indirectly related to gambling harm, and these deal with partner violence and self-harm. 
Partner violence, both victimization and perpetration is elevated among those who have experienced gambling related harm. The Health and Human Services websites provides information about this problem. And if you're going to integrate gambling treatment into your practices, you'll wanna have these resources available. Like domestic violence, self-harm is also elevated among individuals who have experienced gambling related harm. This is true even after taking into consideration people's co-occurring conditions, which place them at increased risk as well. In support of self-harm generally, Health and Human Services also provides access to a number of verified helplines, which you should have easily available. Thank you for listening to this webinar. We hope it was informative and engaging. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the New Hampshire Council on Problem Gambling or the New Hampshire Council for Responsible Gambling. Thank you.